<laughs> My name is Patrick Bond, and I'm at the Center for Civil Society at the center of the earth in Durban, South Africa. And we hosted a meeting called the BRICS Summit in March 2013. And I'm going to discuss what we learned, especially in the context of the world capitalist crisis and its financial manifestations, by describing the crisis and by asking whether the BRICS countries are anti-imperialist or sub-imperialist. I'm going to ask whether the BRICS pose a danger to Africa. They say Africa is rising, is it? Because Africa suffers a resource curse. Luckily, we have the beginnings of resistances that span the BRICS. We need to think about them and how to make them stronger. We begin with the idea that Rosa Luxemburg gave us. Accumulation of capital bursts out in crisis, and it's only the continuous and progressive disintegration of non-capitalist organization that makes accumulation possible. That means that the capitalist system relies on non-capitalist spheres like mutual aid, like women and their unpaid work, like nature to get super profits. We see that when we understand the crisis that's been underway since the early 1960s. We say crisis because it's a stagnant period of over-accumulated capital, much as Karl Marx would have recognized, with a decline in the per-person growth in the world economy from 3.6 to 2.1 to 1.3 to 1% in recent decades. What we also know now is how finance delinks as stagnation in the real economy proceeds, we see financial bubbling going out of control. The stagnation is mostly in the North, Japan, Europe, the United States. The United States has a very important decline in the rate of profit of their corporations beginning in the 70s and never really picking up again when we consider that some of the profits in the last 20 years have mainly been financial. Because whereas US corporations used to finance their internal profits through manufacturing, in subsequent decades we've seen a spatial fix and a temporal fix, as David Harvey puts it, geographically US corporations reaching out further for cheaper labor, for new markets, for uh, environmental goods and services that can be had cheap. Um, and also with a temporal fix, using the financial system to delay the crisis by creating credit and investing in financial assets. And that's why US corporate profits became finance addicted from the mid 1980s onward with a vast proportion up to 40 percent by 2007 of the US corporate profits coming from financial activities. We had also the hollowing of, a corp of corporate uh, America. This is again the, the, the core engine of world capitalism. Manufacturing profits declining, financial profits soaring. And debt became a mode of economic survival. Debt as a percentage of GDP soared from the early 1980s, especially when we consider goods produced as a percentage of GDP, which declined quite dramatically from the 1970s onward. And we call this the overaccumulation of capital, because too much capital is out there to justify its re-entry and reinvestment. So a stagnation occurs, but there was an exception. In the late 1990s, lots of new investment occurred in dot-com and software activities. And those turned out to be a bubble, as you see. That bubble burst and the reinvestment of capital um, slowed down and capacity utilization again and that led us to 2008. In September, the world 
the financial system began to melt down, but production was also dramatically affected. Originally, those first uh, nine months through April 2008 were about as bad as the 1929 period. The same for trade, indeed even worse, as we learned in Durban when our port became very quiet. The volume of trade crashed dramatically in the first nine months of our crisis. 13%, 13% of GDP in 2009. And that reflected huge borrowing to try to stimulate the economies, especially of the North, but also of the BRICS. Eventually, of course, they ran into a ceiling. By switching the private debt to the public, they reached their political limits. And that is called sequestration in the United States, whereas in the EU, it reflects a variety of problems in the pigs countries, Portugal, Ireland, um, Italy, uh, and Greece and Spain. And those countries, many of them actually for nearly defaulted or required huge IMF bailouts. So this meltdown in, you, in the United States and Europe, the sequestration, this represents a huge bailout which taxpayers and ordinary people are paying through the new rounds of austerity. We can still see um, the temporal fix playing out through derivatives, which are the second generation of financial gambles, as well as through quantitative easing, which is a fancy word for saying print money. And the US Federal Reserve continues to do so at a rate of about $85 billion a month, just running the printing presses. This now is coming home to haunt us in the BRICS, because in July, we began to see with the Federal Reserve saying they would taper off and slow down this printing of money, the BRICS countries becoming much less attractive as um, smart money went to their safe haven, the US dollar. What we saw in the US were interest rates increasing quite dramatically in the middle of 2013. And that meant that huge flows of funds went out of the emerging markets. And that led to currency crashes. The Indian rupee losing about 40%, along with the Russian ruble, the Indonesian rupee, the Brazilian real, the South African rand. At one point, it was so bad that the Goldman Sachs leader, Jim O'Neill, Jim uh, McNeil, said that this meant there was only one BRICS left out of five, the C, China. The others had crashed. And what this means is uneven development again played a critical role in global capitalism. You can see this long-term decline in the northern hemisphere. And suddenly, from uh, China and East Asia, and then from some of the other emerging countries in the south, an improvement in GDP in the recent period. But this unevenness gets amplified as a contradiction, especially in the trading system, where the current account deficit increases. Also in the stock markets, where the financial bubbling, when it crashes, becomes extreme. You can see the Russian uh, stock market crashed 72% in 2008. China crashed 62%, India 61%, and South Africa about 52%. Those crashes represent that volatility when financialization hits economies whose real underlying assets are not growing nearly as fast as the financial assets. And then we were hit at the same time with the decline in commodity prices. Oil, for example, went from about $145 a barrel to as low as $35 before recovering. Massive declines in commodity prices over this period. And that meant we began to understand, under pressure, countries even as powerful and apparently ascendant as the BRICS, which, as you see in this slide, did pretty well compared to the rest of the world, they began to suffer devaluations. First, as David Harvey puts it, 
their absorbers, and then their producers of surplus capital. And then they become competitors on the world stage. But then something important happens. As Harvey puts it, what might be called sub-imperialisms arise. Each developing center of capital accumulation needs systematic spatio-temporal fixes for its own surplus capital. And that's where the territorial sphere of influence becomes important. That's how we can theorize BRICS. You don't have to. You can think like Lula. A new global economic geography has been born, according to Brazil's former president. Here are the five BRICS countries. Jim O'Neill, Goldman Sachs's strategist, thought of these as the building block BRICS of 21st century world capitalism. He initially said BRIC, and South Africa was included from 2010. And here they are meeting in Durban in March, BRICS from above. Here's the space they chose, the Durban Convention Center, Africa's biggest. And their claim was that they were working together against the legacy of slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, and neoliberalism, especially in Africa. This was the first time BRICS would come together in Africa. South Africa promising to be the gateway. These BRICS countries just want a seat at the table. That means we can ask, are they anti-imperialist? Or are they sub-imperialist? It reminds us of Berlin. This was 1885, the scramble for Africa. Such a scramble is now underway again. Here were the people from Britain, France, Belgium, Portugal, and Germany, as well as two smaller imperial powers, carving up the map of Africa without regard for the people living there. What they wanted was a logical way to bring in the infrastructure that they had, the railroad lines and bridges, the ports, the roads, so they could get to the plantations and the mines with infrastructure to uplift Africa. They weren't really about uplifting Africa, they were really about looting Africa. And that's similar to what the BRICS want when they look at the map of Africa and its resources, <coughs> its oil and gas fields, and its mineral deposits. This is useful Africa, as Le Monde Diplomatique put it. What they're really looking for is oil, especially because uh, there is an extraordinary shortage looming unless fracking oil um, and shale gas begin to take the place of standard petroleum. But even today, the US imports about a fifth of its oil from Africa. And there's new oil found all over with drilling, especially in the DRC, Uganda, Tanzania, big gas fields in Mozambique. And that means Africa can be said not anymore to be the hopeless continent, but Africa rising. This is the shout from all of the big magazines, The Economist and Time, and from books. And if you measure the number of citations of those two words, Africa rising, you find dozens and dozens coming up in the major newspapers, magazines. We believe, however, instead of Africa rising, what's most important is that African protests are rising, as Agence France Press shows from 2010 onward, including the North African Arab Spring. Partly this is because there's so much more to protest about thanks to the BRICS and their land grabs about the worst we know, especially India, China, and South Africa. And that means when you hear about Africa rising because of GDP percentage increases, we need to rethink whether this is really Africa rising or Africa crashing. For example, if Africa was really rising, we should see the share of trade of Africa in the world economy growing. But it's been substantially falling over the last 25 years from about 6.5% of world trade to less than 
If Africa were rising, we would expect to see manufacturing value added per person increasing. But in fact, it's pretty stagnant and in most countries, in fact, declining. And in order to understand the gimmick of Africa rising fully, let's deconstruct gross domestic product. Because if you correct GDP for the things it leaves out, world GDP isn't really rising to levels around $50 trillion per year today. What's missing would be resource depletion, all of the minerals pulled out of the ground, air, water, and noise pollution, the farmland and wetlands that are lost, unpaid women's community work, family breakdown and crime, and other social values. So when we correct GDP, we get a genuine progress indicator that's very stagnant as the group Redefining Progress finds it. And in Africa, there's an attempt to correct GDP using two words, natural capital. And the Haberon Declaration of May 2012 calls for us to measure the amount of natural resources that can be commodified and to build that into the national accounts. If you do that, natural capital in South Africa looks pretty good. We have, for every single person, $5,700 worth of natural capital, mostly our subsoil assets as well as cropland and pasture land. However, we deplete a great deal of it, especially coal, as well as other minerals. So we're depleting about 9% of our income, which means we have a decline every year in every South African's wealth, on average, by $245. This is the natural capital depletion impact on our gross domestic product. In, ever, in other words, every South African is getting poorer because we rely on extraction of non-renewable resources. This is the resource curse writ large. Africa is not rising. When you do this calculation for the entire continent, as has the World Bank, Africa is crashing by about 6% of gross national income per year, according to their book, The Changing Wealth of Nations using simply four corrections to GDP, as shown here. So who's rising, if not Africa? It's corporations that loot Africa. The extractive industries' rates of profit have gone through the roof, taking over from even the very high profitability pharmaceutical companies as the leading um, profitable corporations in the world. And that brings us to BRICS and BRICS from below, because the BRICS system is to amplify these processes, notwithstanding their looting and the relationship to untenable financialization. We held a BRICS from below summit in March against the summit of BRICS, and we had a march to the BRICS meeting. including a protest at the U.S. consulate. It was very important for the activists to show that they not only opposed BRICS, but the imperialist power, the United States. I should add that we also had the former Ecuadorian economics minister, Pedro Paez, giving an inspiring speech, which allows us to think about BRICS from below and all of the manifestations of protest in the BRICS countries as part of a long wave of genuine protest movements when neoliberal economics or other forms of oppression become too severe. The identity and consciousness movements, the women's movements, the peace movements, the ecological movements, the alternative and community movements, the peasant movements seem to rise and fall according to the Kondratiev cycle, according to Andre Gunter Frank and Marta Fuentes. Here's the Kondratiev, and there's a debate about whether we are still at the trough, deep in a crisis, or beginning to come out with the destruction of so much value. But there is a rhythm of accumulation. And as Karl Polanyi put it, this generates a double movement 
As accumulation gets too extreme and market power, what we can call neoliberalism, goes further and further into the society, counter movements emerge. And what Karl Polanyi and now Michael Burroway, sociologist at the University of California, have shown is that double movement, the resistance, comes from social, labor, and environmental movements, but now must come more and more in a manner that addresses the super exploitation implicit in uneven and combined development. And that's the exploitation that could lead us to an ecological catastrophe a catastrophe that the BRICS are presently exacerbating and that will continue to become more acute as we have the Warsaw Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change later this month, as well as the continuing unfolding of this capitalist crisis. Thank you.